Before we leave weeks one and two, I wanted to uh, cover two topics in a little more detail. Um, one of them may be new to some of you, and the other one we've already we've already covered in our reading and in the online discussions. So weeks one and two, just as a recap, talked about cultural anthropology, and we didn't get into specifics of um, like local cultural knowledge and and what you know, certain groups are like or whatever. We talked more about cultural processes and that's why this um, idea of, of cultural intelligence um, came up. So the two ideas that I wanted to talk about, one is Bronfenbrenner's theory of social ecology um, or social ecological theory from Yuri Bronfenbrenner. So he is the person who's credited with coming up with the Head Start program and his theory is particularly helpful um, for example, to people who look at um, comparative human development, where they look at how different cultures um, view the growing up process. So this little red dot in the middle, so I've just drawn this little picture of what I think, um, if, if you were going to look at what Braun from Brenner's theory would look like on paper. So the little red dot in the middle would be like the individual person. And that individual person may have right perceptions or wrong perceptions or a blend of those perceptions about themselves, about the environment around them. That person has a worldview and um, a, a self-image. And whether these things are wrong or right, they influence the different layers of this system with that this child lives in. So, And then the system also influences the child. So it's sort of a bi-directional influence. The child is surrounded by this microsystem. And that think of that as these little triangles that would be the home environment, the school environment, maybe the neighborhood that the kid plays in. This is like the immediate, most common context for this kid, okay? Then at the next layer out, where these uh, rectangles are, this would be all of the social institutions or realities, even sort of patterns of thought that would influence the microsystem. So at this level, um, this might be the parent's workplace. So what happens at your parent's workplace affects what happens in your home to some extent. And then things that happen in the school district would affect what happens in the, the kid's classroom. And things that happen, let's say, um, some crime that, um, that the community is now organized against or something, um, that would affect what happens in this kid's neighborhood. So, you know, good positive things and negative things um, in this in this broader system, affect all the things in the clo the system closest to the child, and those systems profoundly affect this child at the middle. Okay, then even further back from that is a macro system, and that would be say um, national events. So um, 9/11 affected that that was an international event, but that affected how. Uh, not only how our, our nation responded um, to like concerns about safety, but even local police, even schools, and um, the kinds of conversations that happen around family dinner tables. So the, the impact of this large-scale event um, was on many different la layers of society. So you notice that this whole system, this big blue rectangle, is on a line, and there's another little tiny system beside it and that's just to show that Bronfenbrenner also talked about a chrono system, and especially the people that came after him talk about chrono systems, which just recognizes that the system that we're in right now in all of its different layers, it's a, it's a moment in time, and it's different than it would have been 10 years ago or even a year ago. So um, the, the point of this um, theory is just the deep embeddedness of this developing person. That's Bronfenbrenner's theory. He likened um, this embeddedness to Russian nesting dolls. So if you just think about that, you would be this little tiny doll right at the middle of this, of this system. He also talked about how the more you interact with different levels, um, the more nuanced and complex and strenuous uh, your interactions become. So, you know, really kind of like the more you get to know your neighborhood, um, the, the richer that interaction is. It may become a lot more difficult. Um, it's a lot more insightful. So he likened it to ping pong. That You know, the longer it goes on, um, this sort of bi-directional influence 
uh, the more intense it gets. So this is just a summary. If you want to pause your um, audio for just a minute and read over that. And then um, I like to think about, now Bronfenmutter did not talk about churches, okay? But I have wondered um, how Bronfenbrenner's theory could apply to the local church. So um, maybe you want to just pause your, your audio. So what I mean by that is just that this individual church is um, at the middle of a lot of different influences. And it then makes you question, okay, what are the right or the wrong perceptions that our church has um, and what influence does our church have on the next layer out and the next layer beyond that? What are the broader implications of who we are and how we reach out or how we don't reach out? And then how do those different layers of society affect us? Here are some of the types of questions that I ask. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about was Hebert's idea of centered sets and bounded sets. And this took up some of our conversation this week on the board, and that's that was very good. So... The essence of it is this. A lot of times our conversations or, or our thinking has been about who's, who is a Christian and who's not a Christian. And we spend a lot of energy trying to define what the boundary is there. So, um, you know, I've had people ask me, for example, well, why, why are Mormons not Christians? You know, and when I was a teenager and when, we, when this conversation would come up, that people would say things like their their services are just like normal church services. If you go to a Mormon service, they sing hymns and they have you ever heard the Mormon choir? It's just beautiful. They sing we sing the same hymns. Uh, we pray. Uh, they do missions work. They talk about um, service and um, you know tithing and all of these things that that we would talk about like in the church that I grew up in. So. So are Mormons Christians. So other things come up like, well, they're very modest and they're they're very loving and they um, you know they're they have great family values. Um, they're generous. They they um, are very helpful. And when we were in Hungary, uh, my husband and I lived in Hungary for a year and um, taught in a college there. But our um, colleagues would say, oh oh yes. Um, oh yes, we know all about missionaries. The the Mormons come and they help us. They helped us at our home last week. And Mormons were all over the place in Hungary, and they were doing all of this service um, to people in the, these communities. And that kind of service really spoke to the people there. So people, you know, a lot of we had to have a lot of conversations about whether Mormons were Christians or not and why. So this is kind of a strenuous way to have the conversation because, um, you know, when you start, I don't know, when Mitt Romney was running for president, there was a lot of discussion about, and in fact, a lot of times there, there were many references to Mormons um, being Christians, and that, that was on TV. So um, it's difficult to draw a boundary if we're, if we're looking at it that way. That would be a bounded set approach. Like, what's the boundary around this group of people we call Christians? So, as Hebert discussed, the centered set approach would be different. Okay, the centered set approach would be like, okay, remember when the Mars rover was off by a degree or two, and it, it missed Mars, and it just now it's just space junk, and it's just flying and tumbling through space um, with, you know, kind of no destination, really. Um, it, missed, it missed the center. It missed where it was really supposed to go. And so, um, instead of looking at a bounded set approach, if you look at a centered set approach, you ask who's moving toward the center. And but the the reality there is that you have to really be able to define the center. What is the center? What is it that makes someone a Christian or not? What's the true center of Christianity? And are people moving toward that or are they moving away from that? So, I think we all would agree that the true center of Christianity is Jesus Christ. And so when you think about Mormons and you have the question about, you know, whether, for example, they are Christians or they are not Christians, um, if we set aside all the stuff they do or all the stuff they don't do or all the ways they behave or the commitments they have, if we take away that kind of conversation, which is the, the bounded set conversation, and we look at the centered set conversation, we ask, do they, is Jesus, um, as Mormons see him, who he really is. So 
Um, and if you look into Mormonism and if you look into what they believe about Jesus, I think you very quickly uh, come to the realization that that's like a Mars rover that completely misses the mark. They're not moving to the true center. So the question has come up on the board, and it's a, it's a very good one. Um, aren't boundaries needed sometimes? So again, in a theoretical sense, if we're talking about our own churches here in the U.S., we can say, oh, well, let's just not talk about boundaries. Let's just talk about whether people are moving toward the center. Well, okay, but sometimes boundaries are necessary. And when you're in a cross-cultural context and people are doing things that don't seem understandable to you, they seem very foreign and strange to you, your, your instinct sort of to like impose a boundary is going to be very strong. So you really have to understand when do you need boundaries and why. But here's why I think boundaries are necessary and important sometimes. Sometimes you cannot honor the two greatest commandments without a boundary. So can you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And can you love your neighbor as yourself? And if a certain behavior or practice hinders your ability or a local body's ability to do that, then you're going to have to draw a boundary there um, and say that's not something that we're going to allow here. Also, what about abundant life? There are some behaviors and practices that that you can't engage in and still have an abundant life or the people around you can't experience abundant life. And the third thing is that we're not just, this thing, these things are not just benign. They're not just um, neutral. Um, there's actually a prowling lion out there that's seeking to devour people. And um, we have to be particularly careful um, you know, to, to just say we're not going to have any boundaries because there are some some practices or behaviors that can give the enemy a foothold in a believer's life or in a, um, you know, to allow the enemy to work in the, in a local church. So to bring some clarification as well about, um, about the craft reading, um, craft calls this a three-legged stool, okay? So that appropriate Christianity contextualizes accurately in three dimensions, allegiance, power, and truth or knowledge. So, um, it's, he's not saying uh, knowledge is not important. He's saying that for someone really to have a, a, a healthy, um, flourishing, um, stable grasp of the gospel, they need not only to have made this heart change and this decision that I'm going to follow Jesus, and that's where my allegiance is going to rest, um, they also need to understand you know, how do you live a good life? Where does power for that come from? Um, and then as far as truth and knowledge, do they actually, um, it's not just amassing a bunch of facts and figures. It's, a, it's actually knowing what you believe and why you believe it.